to be here to share some recent work from our group. And specifically, we work uh, work for a conversational system, specifically for two direction. One is about scalability, and another one is for robustness. So I will talk about three different topic in this talk. Okay. And everyone know that our goal is trying to help Ironman drivers. Um, they can help us to finish a lot of different tasks uh, efficiently. That's why so many leading companies produce such intelligent systems. For example, Apple Siri or Google Assistant, and currently we have the Amazon Alexa. Okay, so I think I don't need to uh, describe the motivation. Let's directly go deep into the classical framework in the task-oriented dialogue system. Usually, in the task-oriented dialogue Look, system, no matter you work on Siri or uh, Google Assistant or Alexa, you must follow this framework. First of all, your input is, if your input is from a speech, you need to have a speech recognition to transcribe speech into text. And also, you can directly work on the text input. Okay, are there any action movie to see this weekend? Asked by this user. The first component is we want to understand this language, right? It means we want to extract the semantic point from this sentence. For example, the intent of the user is this user want to get some movie list. So the intent is about request movie. And definitely not all movies satisfy this constraint. They have some specific constraint for this movie. For example, the general should be action movie and also date should be this weekend. So after we get the semantic friend, including user intent and some slots, we can automatically form a query to search the database. If we have a database containing a lot of different movies, we just do the query. And then we get a return list. When one, uh, a lot of people will think, after we do the query, we can directly get the answer and we can directly return to the user. However, it's different from the uh, retrieval system because sometimes if you get a uh, hundred of movies satisfying this query, then the agent's goal is trying to help the user to narrow down the search space in order to find the certain movie this user really interesting in. So the second component is really difficult, which is called dialogue manager. The dialogue manager trying to, based on the da database return information, and to decide which action is the best action to interact with user. You can imagine dialogue manager just like the brain of the human agent. For example, if you get the hundreds of movie satisfying this constraint, probably we can ask additional question. And if you just get like three movies, we can directly return to the user. And sometimes if you are confused about the input, you can make the confirmation question as well. So for here, we, um, we call this is the dialogue policy. Dialogue manager trying to generate the system action, for example, you can request additional location. And then generate the corresponding natural language, get back to the user. And in the second iteration, the user will say the second turn, and we were trying to understand it correctly, and also fit into dialogue manager to decide the next action. And everyone know that usually most work focus on the length understanding side, because length understanding uh, is viewed as the first component in this pipeline. So if you get some error from language understanding, it will be very difficult to have a better interaction in the dialogue manager. So a lot of people try to extract the good semantic behind the original input. And everyone know that recently there's a huge advance in natural language processing based on this contextualized embedding, such as Elmo or Bert. And this, two, uh, this type of pre-trained model shows that they can get a lot of understanding performance in improvement just based on this pre-trained length model. So 
it already showed the good performance on the understanding task. So why not we just directly put it into our target task and trying to utilize this pre-trained model and see whether they can perform, improve our understanding performance. However, there's a question mark. Because if you want to directly apply this pre-training model to your target task, you make the assumption that your input is the text input. Because this pre trained model is trained in the written text. However, uh, most of the time, a lot of application, the original input comes from a speech signal. So if you only look at this sentence, not listen to this sentence, you will see that Live all lives to Morocco. Hmm? Uh, what does it mean? It's very difficult to understand it correctly. The reason is this sentence includes some recognition error. Actually, the original sentence is list all flight tomorrow. So if we only look at this sentence, it will be very difficult to get the embedding which is similar to the original sentence. But if you listen to this sentence, it will be very similar to each other. So the reason is we separate the speech recognition and understanding differently. Speech people trying to um, produce the better output based on their whatever rate. However, the language understanding model trying to extract the correct, correct semantics based on the input and they also assume the input is the perfect text. However, it's not true. Sometimes you will have some error from the speech recognition. So you want to consider this recognition error in order to have better and robust performance. Due to the mismatch between written and spoken language, for example, if you imagine Bert or Elmo, which is trained in written language, because written language is easily to get. You can get a lot of a large amount of written language instead of speech. However, during your target scenario, you want to test in the spoken language. The spoken language may include some recognition error. So there's a mismatch. So our goal is we want to have a contextualized embedding which is robust to ASR errors. It means that we can have the embedding specifically for spoken input. And hopefully, in the spoken language understanding task, this embedding can achieve better performance. It means we can get a better result on ASR transcript and also remain similar performance on manual transcript. This is our goal. So we propose the first solution, which is want to adapt the transformer to allow them to accept, accept ASR lattice. Let's see the architecture behind BERT or, for example, GPT during the pre-training and fine-tuning. During the pre-training, you can imagine you have a transformer encoder, right? And you just predict the next word one by one. And you can directly take this pre-trained model and do your target task using fine-tuning. If your target task is about a classification task, you can directly take the weight from the original transformer and then fit your target task here and then to fine tune this weight. However, it only allow the input is the sequential input in transformer architecture, right? However, ASR actually can produce more, uh, much richer information such as lattice. This is the lattice illustration Usually, the ASR system, you only take the one sentence, which is the highest probability in this whole, uh, in this whole path. Because the, some correct word may appear in this lattice, but not have the highest probability. So instead of fitting the top one sentence, we can directly take the whole uh, lattice into our model and probably they will have better performance because they can consider more information once. So the current problem become 
how can we fit that is into transformer, right? Because when you train your target task, originally they only allow the sequential input, not the lattice input. So the naive way is we just do the like BFS search, then use this uh, lattice and we will uh, map into the sequential input. And then we can also take this sequential input into our transformer encoder because uh, we assume probably this input contains some correct word and hopefully they will automatically get this information. So linearized one is the naive way, just like a baseline one to compare. And however, if we only do the linearized version, it, we just lost some structure information in the original lattice. Because if we do like uh, DFS or BFS, then it's very difficult to maintain the uh, relation between words, right? It all, in this way, we lost the information in the original lattice. So we propose two different approach, which is called like masking appro approach. So what is the masking approach? In the transformer, we will have the self-attention module, right? So I, I believe everyone is very familiar with this uh, equation. This is the attention weight, okay? So in the original transformer paper, during the decoding, they will have the mask in order to mask, mask out the following words because it haven't been generated yet, okay? So it only allowed you to attend the previous word. So this is the masking. So we want to manipulate the weight in this mask in order to allow the model to know the structure in the original lattice. For example, this is the lattice and we want to manipulate this, the weight in M in order to allow, for example, this is the target word and we do some masking in order to allow this word can only attend the word which is the prefix of this word in the same path. And for another example, if a target word is two, then the all word from different paths because they also, they, they all are the prefix word towards this target word. We want to manipulate the mask in order to make them to aware of the original structure. This is the main idea. So we call it binary mask because if you, if the word is the prefix and we do not do any mask, if the word otherwise, we will assign like the in negative infinity to penalize this word cannot be able to attend to like the word which is not the prefix, prefix word, okay? So either with the attention or without attention. And definitely we can have like a soft version which is use the uh, information like probability in the lattice. For example, in the original lattice, there's HA has some probabil probability. Then we want to utilize this information to make it as a soft version, okay? So we have a binary version and a probabilistic version. And let's uh, do the experiment to see whether they can improve the spoken language understanding result. So let me wrap up. Uh, we directly take the pre trained model and we want to test in our target task. So for our target task, we use the benchmark ATIS data, which is the um, ALI traveling system. So we want to use the training set of the ATIS data as our fine tuning part. Then we can use the linearized version and or like a baseline is the Top, uh, top one result and a linearized version and uh, like two proposed version. So based on this understanding result, we have the slot accuracy and also the intent accuracy. And you can see the performance if we only take the one best result. And for here, our input has the word error rate come from the ASR system, which is um, 50%. And using linearized lattice, we can get a slightly small improvement because probably some word 
which will appear in the lattice, and we can capture this information. And if we use the binary version or probabilistic version, we can get the additional improvement. And also, when our ASR is getting difficult, for example, if the word error rate increase, we will see the improvement, the performance improvement will be larger than previous version. And they will also show that we will have like similar performance for the ground uh, the manual transcription, not the ASL result. So it means that our, in, in, uh, our approach can consider some spoken confusion when we input this lattice into our fine tuning state. However, a lot of people ask, what if we do not have ASR lattice? Because some people just want to directly take the Google ASR or like uh, Amazon or Microsoft ASR and directly take the ASR result and use it then as the input. So in this way, we do not have the ASR lattice. We cannot perform this model to this scenario. So we propose another solution which we directly learn this ASR robust embedding without lattice information. And the idea is really simple. And let's see how can we do that. And we take the Elm as example. Okay, mm, the benefit of this approach is the computation is almost the same as the one bit because you do not consider like a whole, um, for example, if you use um, like another person asked if you take like top 10 result and run it 10 times and do the ensemble, probably you can get like better performance to compare. But we do not compare with that result. The reason is they need 10 times uh, resource to do, to get this result. But for this one, we also do like one, one test. Because the original one best is we only take the one sequence in our, as our input. But for this one, we also take one sequence as our input, but we do some manipulate for the masking. So only the word will be uh, longer than like the one best version, but the computation resource may not increase a lot. Just, uh, I think it, it's not, it does not have any significant difference. Okay, there's also a detail about our um, implementation. For this one, we ensure the word, for example, this word, we take the longest pass, for example, for this word, zero, one, two, three, four. So we take the positional embedding for this one as four. And so for this one, we just ensure the prefix will be uh, less than the the, the, the word which is the, in the following word. So they will have some maybe one, uh, zero, one, two, and then four without three. Right. So any question about the first part? So let me continue the second approach. So for second approach, I take the Elmo as example because originally Elmo uh, was trained in written text. It means Elmo can only watch the input, cannot listen to the input because Elmo does not have the ears. So we want them to have some ears. Want them to aware of the acoustic confusion. So the idea is really simple. For example, you have the ground truth sentence. Show me the fares from Dallas to Boston. And you have the ASR result. <coughs> Show me affairs from Dallas to Boston. And after you run the force alignment, for example, you can use the simple way, just directly do the word alignment. And you find oh, these two words are aligned to each other. And definitely you can um, do in a fine manner. For example, you can decompose each word into the phonetic sequence and then do the alignment again, and then trans transform into the original word. And you can do it. In our experiment, we only do it in the word level way. 
So we know these two words are aligned to each other. So our idea is because if you directly take the ELMO, and then ELMO will generate the embedding for each word in the original sentence and also for the ASR sentence. And then you will find that the embedding for this word and this word will be totally different because although they have very similar context, but these are two different words, so they are different. However, the reason is Elmo did not hear about the sound. If you can hear about the sound, fierce and fierce, it's, it sounds very similar. So we want them to be aware of this confusion. So we directly do some adaptation about the embedding for this word <laughs> and this word should be close to each other. Okay, so after we take the pre-training embedding and do the alignment, we just ask the model can generate the embedding similar to the word which aligned with the original word, for example, this one. And also all aligned word, the aligned pair, we will do the, we will, we will add it into our objective function to allow them to have similar embedding in this scenario. Then hopefully our embedding after this fine tuning, we will have better embedding which can aware of the acoustic confusion. Then in a spoken scenario, if you directly take the ASR result, you can have very similar, which you can have the embedding which is similar to the original ground truth sentence. So you don't need to take and uh, worry about here, there's some misrecognition. You directly take it in, into your model. Your model will automatically consider the confusion and also, for example, increase the probability of the affairs. So they will have maybe have a higher chance to get a better understanding output. So this is the supervised way. And definitely, sometimes you do not have the transcript for your speech data. So you can run it in unsupervised manner. For example, you have speech data and then you just run the speech recognition and to generate like top five results. And then you run the alignment through this top five results. Then you can also adapt your embedding to have similar, uh, to have similar embedding in terms of the acoustic confusion. Okay. So definitely this one will be slightly better than the unsupervised one because you actually know the ground truth, and ground truth word. For this one, you do not know that. So we do the same uh, experiment for ATIS as well. And you will see that this is the original performance directly take from the pre-trained Elmo. And then because the pre-trained Elmo do not aware of our target task, they do not probably do not have this airline information. So the bad comparison is we need to fine tune the language model for Elmo to serve as our bad baseline because our performance will also, will also run in the training set of the ATIS data. So we take the training set of the ATIS data and then to run the language model fine tuning for original pre-trained Elmo. So this is the actual baseline for comparison. Adding a, confusion, a quick confusion in supervised or unsupervised way, we can both get the improvement and also we test to different data set and also different whatever way and the trend are all similar to this figure. So we show, we think that the performance will be improved because we have better ASR robust embedding. And I think it's really important direction because a lot of people do not aware of, of the gap between beast and uh, natural NLP size. So Hopefully we can directly take down, for example, spoken Elmo or bird to, uh, so to mitigate the gap between these two components. And definitely we want to test whether this approach can generalize to different ASR because currently we only did with one single ASR and we are not sure whether they can generalize to others. So uh, is there any question for the the previous approach. Okay. So 
let's continue to the second topic. The second topic is about scalability. Let's go back to this figure. Uh, now that this is a database here, because you need to have a database in order to search the movie results, right? So this database usually is store some structured data, for example, the tables and like the movie and restaurant or so on. However, the enterprise saying that only 20% of the data will be structured data, like more, like 80% of the data is unstructured data. For example, some uh, files, emails, spreadsheets, and so on. So if we stick, uh, if we need to have like a, that's the previous framework, we cannot allow our model to interact with the unstructured data. So, but if we want to scale our use, usage, like application usage, we need to consider structured data and also unstructured one. So because we also want to do the conversational manner, so we can directly take the, we can borrow the idea from QA. We ask the machine to read this big unstructured text and serve as a teacher. And the user can ask question from the teacher, just like a student. And this one, you need to know that the question can be asked in a conversational manner because sometimes you will uh, narrow down the, or you'll, you will have the follow up question according to like previous answer or previous question. For example, the original passage is about the description about this stock, okay, this famous stock. And then you can ask the question about this passage and do some follow up question. Was he the star? So there are some co-reference uh, approach then because the, you need to understand the previous con conversational history in order to correctly answer the current question. This is called conversational QA test. And currently there are two um, popular benchmark data we want to uh, experiment on. So we propose a solution trying to consider the con conversational context and we call it flow delta. What's the idea? It's, it's, it's a really simple idea. Our idea is because during this multi-turn interaction, you will, um, the user will ask multiple questions, right? So you can imagine that this is the original whole passage, okay? And this is also the original whole passage. All three blocks are the same only the time difference. In the first question, probably you will focus on this part. And for the second question, you may switch to like second part and so on. This is just a simple illustration. Remember every QA model, they will uh, encode the passage into a certain embedding, right? Because the embedding will help you to do some attention and trying to generate the answer. So the attention, like the embedding information for word in passage will be different if you have different question, okay? So you can imagine this is the vector for the word here in this passage. And uh, during the second question, the embedding will be slightly different okay? because the question is different. How about we ask additional mechanism to model the difference between them. The idea here is we want, hopefully the user will have some con conversational behavior and the model can learn this behavior to help the model to understand what the behavior change, like information change between different questions. Then this information can help the model to better identify the correct answer. So for implementation, we directly take the embedding here and com compute the difference between these two embedding as our mechanism. That's why we call flow delta because we measure the difference between the flow. 
and the flow, I, the idea about flow, the concept about flow was proposed by another paper and want to utilize that paper idea, like the flow idea. But we focus on the difference, like information gain between dialog flow. Because this idea is very general, it's flexible to apply to different type of QA system. For example, we test on flow QA and also bird model, okay? Because if your QA system can perform the embedding for each word in the passage, you can apply this mechanism above your architecture for this one and for bird as well. And let's see the results. Uh, Quark and Coca are two benchmark data set for conversational QA. And this is the baseline performance. Flow QA actually was the first uh, approach to trying to solve this context, uh, conversational QA uh, task uh, before uh, the BERT was proposed. So this is the BERT performance. They directly take the each question in independently. This is the performance they can achieve. And adding the concept about flow proposed by flow QA, you can get the additional improvement above BERT. Okay, this are our baseline for comparison. When you add flow delta for both model and for both data set, you can easily get the improvement. And definitely the idea can be applied to different QA system as well. And when we submit this, uh, this model, we get the third place in the leaderboard. And it's the first one which has the publication and we can implement it because we want to apply our mechanism above this two models as well, but they do not have any reference to see what's the uh, implementation about this model. But we think because this idea is really general, so they probably can directly apply to this model as well. And these days, the the place already, already changed. So probably other, but still like the performance better than us, they do not have any reference to see. So we cannot check the, the their model. Okay, anyone have any question about this part? Oh, I see. Um, the idea flow is just have the RNN between these three, Q, uh, this uh, continuous question. This is just the flow. So we add additional difference. For example, we do not care. We do not care about the weight for here. We care about the difference between these two uh, parts. Uh, we add directly in the flow concept. So we probably we can um, like it inflict have both, but um, may not be the same as we add flow and also flow delta. Yeah. So it only tells us on the contextualized and the conversational cues is important for us to understand the following questions. And uh, probably the behavior will be similar, then that's why we can use the machine to model that. So the last part is about understanding and generation. Okay, there's two components. Natural language understanding NLU is trying to parse the natural language into structured semantics. For example, this is the original sentence. You want to extract the semantic friends, including block and associate values. Okay, so this is called NLU. And for NLG, usually want to construct natural language based on the structure semantic, like this one, and then map to original natural language. And definitely you can easily think about there's a duality between NLU and NLG, right? 
And usually, we train these two models separately. We have the annotation data, and we train the NLU with the nature link and also the output. And we train the NLG with the output and also original semantic frame as the input. So previously, there's no prior work leverage this duality relation. So we want to utilize this dual, uh, duality relation in order to improve both NLU and also NLG. So our solution is inspired by dual supervised learning, and which is proposed for machine translation. If you are working on machine translation, back translation, is, you must know that. And this is the dual supervised learning approach. Consider that you have two domains, X and Y, and you have two tasks, mapping from X to Y and mapping from Y to X, okay? Because this duality, so you can have the joint probability P, X, Y, which can be decomposed into this direction or this direction, right? Okay. And ideally, this one, this equation will hold because this one actually is the task which is from, is mapped from Y to X. This is the model here. And this is the model here. And what you want to consider is the additional probability for PY and PX. Ideally, if this duality holds, you will have this equation. And dual supervised learning is motivated by this equation. Originally, you have two separate tasks and you want to optimize these two tasks uh, separately. Then for example, when you train the model to map from X to Y, this is your objective function. And if you want to train the model from Y to X, this is your another objective function. So you train this separately. So these days, because of this equation, we want to add an additional loss which comes from the duality. Which means if we know this should equal to this one, then the, the weight here minus here will be close to zero, right? So that's why we define this duality loss. This one is this part. And then this one is equal to this part, okay? So we directly add this duality loss into your objective function for both tasks. That means when you train from X to Y, you need to additionally consider some duality come from Y to X and for another direction as well. So this is the uh, information come from another test, right? So a further question is how can we get these two weights? How can we model the marginal distribution for X and Y? Okay, so what is X and what is Y? Let's go back to our original setting, NLU and NLG. This is our original setting. For NLU, from natural link to semantic friend. So X is natural language, Y is semantic friend. It, it's quite different from machine translation because in machine translation, both are natural link, but in different language. So the next step we need to do is we want to model this marginal probability. So for the X, which is easier because X is the natural language domain. So we can directly take a link model to model this distribution. For example, we just use very simple GRU to model this distribution. Okay, so for link, uh, natural language domain, what well done, we just take the, this natural language and to learn the link model and use them to estimate P of X. However, for another domain, which is semantic friend, usually people treat 
NLU as the multi-label classification problem. Each label indicate a slot value pair. For example, a, a label which indicate restaurant is equal to McDonald's. And usually this semantic fringe can be represented as a multi-hop representation. So we think how to use, how to model this marginal distribution of Y. So if Y contain a lot of slot value pair, then the naive way is we just calculate the prior probability for each label, right? Each label is the slot value pair. So doing this whole training data, we can calculate the prior distribution for each label. Then we can compute the P of Y based on uh, manipul um, manipulation between multiple label for this semantic frame to estimate this probability. However, here we make the assumption that all labels are independent, right? That's why that that's how we can compute this one based on this equation. However, if you look at the labels, sometimes you definitely don't know that labels are in, are dependent. For example, McDonald's may imply cheap but not expensive, right? And some French uh, French restaurant may imply expensive rather than cheap. So there's some correlation between labels. So we may not be able to directly take this naive approach to truly model the distribution in our data. So let's consider another approach, which called mask autoencoder. This uh, approach is for estimate the distribution. The idea is because you have a multiple label and but you don't know the dependency between labels and this approach trying to introduce the sequential dependency and trying to learn the dependency based on some masking connection. For example, this is three different labels. And when you, and when you tr use this autoencoder, they want to reconstruct original like uh, joint probability. And when you mask some of the A's for this figure, for this illustration, the first label you need to produce is P of at two, because this one did not depend on other labels. But for the second one here, X1 may depend on X2, so they'll have the dependency based on the link, okay? Then, and so on. So you can directly utilize this sequential dependency to estimate the final joint distribution. And based on, you train your, based on this autoencoder, it will automatically figure out the dependency between the labels. And hopefully they can truly model our uh, distribution, label distribution in our training set. So we can, after we do this, um, made, we can compute the marginal distribution based on this equation. Then this is the marginal distribution of Y. Y is the semantic frame. Okay, because we just want to consider whether including duality, we can get the improvement. So we just use very basic NLU and NLG model. We use GRU for both. And let's see whether we can get improvement if we consider another direction. And for NLG and NLU, this is the baseline, which means we train these two components separately. And if we use the dual supervised learning without make, just use the naive approach to estimate the, the distribution for semantic frame, we can get the improvement for generation part. However, we cannot get improvement for, an, for understanding one because natural language distribution is easy to model and, but only this distribution is, uh, is better for us to involve in the duality. For another side, we may not get the improvement. 
but if we add this made to estimate the label dependency, then we can get further improvement for both uh, NLG and also NLU. It means that we need to consider the domain property in order to better model the distribution. Okay, let's summarize three different topics I'm talked about in this talk. First of all, for conversational AI, both can link embedding are necessary. The reason is so many applications are come from the speech interaction. And also written text usually enough for pre-trained embedding, but speech signal may not be enough. But there's a mismatch when you apply to your spoken scenario. So we want to do some ad adaptation. The first one adaptation method is if you get the ASR letter, you have rich uh, information about a critic directly come from the ASR system. You want to feed this lattice structure to your transformer encoder so that during the fine tuning, it will automatically know the confu word confusion come from the original ASR. And the second one is if you do not have the ASR, but you can also use the word alignment to align the a critic confused word and also do this adaptation in order to have ASR robust embedding. And the second part is about scalability. We want to extend our scenario not only to access the structured data, but also unstructured data. For structured data, you can use the traditional framework. And for unstructured data, you can use QA model. And QA model, if you use in conversational way, you need to consider some conversational cues. So that's why we propose this flow delta. And the third one, we're trying to improve NLU and NLG because of scalability. Because if we need to have like a, a, a notation for both sides, it will be relatively difficult if we can only get some duality information and probably we can have small set of the training data and we can achieve a similar performance compared to one with the large data training data. And also based on this duality, we probably want to move for, further to unsupervised way or semi-supervised way because we have a lot, a lot of natural language parts, but just a lot of them do not have the semantic friend annotation. So here, first of all, we we'll try dual supervised learning to leverage this duality. And the important takeaway is you definitely need to consider your task because in this task, the data distribution about these two domain is quite different. You need to have different way to model this distribution. Then you may have improvement when you in leverage the duality. And we show that this performance can get improvement and uh, hopefully we can have better performance if we move further to unsupervised scenario. Any question? I'm ready to answer. Thank you. Um, for for this experiment, we directly take the, for example, our target task. We have the um, pair data, and we use the semantic frame part to first estimate the distribution. But definitely, if you have, um, for example, I, I think for the application-wise, sometimes you will have 
and the, the human agent, they do some uh, distant query. And this one can be easily to record, but the uh, natural link design may not be able to be recorded. So the rugby take this uh, behavior, you will have also large amount of semantic friend. You can turn on to estimate the a, a correlation between different attribute. For example, you will automatically allow your model to know, oh, this restaurant may have specific attribute and this will help you to estimate the generation and also understanding part. Any other question? Thank you so much.